Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Purpose Up podcast. Today, I am super excited to have with me Tim Brownson. Welcome, Tim. Thank you very much for having me. All right. I'm super excited to dive into the work that you do and uh, the re-release of your latest book. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Let's tell uh, the audience what it is that you do. Okay. So I do spend a lot of time now working with coaches, but I've been a full-time coach myself since 2005. Um, focusing really on helping people get unstuck and trying to put more meaning in their lives. And that took me into the, the world of core values because I think these are so important. So when I'm working with clients now, I'm very often working, doing work around core values. All right. Awesome. So let's, um, we're going to get back to the core values, but mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's yeah. talk about your, your superhero origin story. Let's talk about how you, how you got into <laughs> coaching and, and where you, where you originally came from. Yeah. So I, I spent 20 years in, in sales, uh, very successful from the outside. Anybody looking in would think, okay, that guy's got it all squared off, but I hadn't got anything squared off. I was um, super stressed all the time, working crazy hours, spending literally tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, one year I, I spent close to $20,000 on vacations just to get away from work to try and recover so that I could then go back to work to, um, to start it all over again. And people ask me, you know, how did you get into coaching? I actually can't remember originally where I heard about it, but I can remember thinking, okay, I'm going to go and get some life coach training. This was back in 2004. I thought I'm going to get some life coach training because it will give me some of the tools to work on myself, but also make me a better sales manager so that I can relate to people. So I went and did the training and thought, oh, wow, this is like, this is like sales without the crap. You know, without all the without all the reporting and all the pressure. You know, so the three the three key skills that you need to be a good uh, coach are you need to be able to build rapport, you need to be able to ask good questions, and you need to be able to listen. They're the exact same skills you need to be a good salesperson. Uh, you know, at a, at a corporate level, you've got to be able to ask great questions, listen, and, and and build rapport. Right. So from that point. We already knew, so that was sort of May 2005, we knew that we were moving to the US in February 2006. And as I said, the vacations I was getting was the one saving grace with five weeks paid vacation. Yeah, I thought if I go to the US and move in sales, I'm going to get one paid week of vacation a year and it just filled me with dread. Right. So, so that was it. I thought, okay. Well, this looks easy to do, coaching. I'll do this. That was a that was a mistake. <laughs> well, I mean, it's 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 a good question. You know, as a as a as a life coach myself, uh, one year in the full time world, what what was it like for you stepping into that and um, you, you intuited that it wasn't easy? So tell us about the, those early days. Ben, I was a complete idiot, to be quite honest with you. I, I went, I went, I, I seemed to the the the, the scale just tipped from being workaholic to um, not a workaholic, going and grabbing a beer and sitting by the pool. We rented a house to begin with, which should go to the pool and it's, and, and the, the tipping point for me, so I did very little in the first three years, so, so it's three years before I, I, I sort of got my shit together and really dove into online marketing and understanding how to build a business. But, but back in those days, there was no competition. So I was getting some clients just because there was nobody else for them to hire in my, uh, we were sort of west side of, of Orlando. There were two other coaches, to the best of my knowledge. So I will get clients in spite of myself rather than, rather than because of myself. Right. Um, so it, it, was, it was tough, but it was, it was born out of ignorance. You know, the, the, if, you, if you look around now, if you're a new life coach now, there's just hundreds of different resources, Facebook groups or blogs or companies that will supply you with this, especially for coaches or that or whatever. Of course, back then there was none of that. So I was trying to figure stuff out on, on my own and rather stupidly in, re, in reflection, thinking, well, I worked in sales. How, how different can marketing be? You know, because I've had liaised with marketing departments sometimes. It's like, this is easy. It's not right. just sales. Uh, yeah. So, so I think it's one of those things where afterwards you're glad you didn't know what you didn't know. Right. Because I, because I don't think I'd have done it, uh, Ben, if I'm being absolutely honest. I think I, I would have, you know, so like I said, it was three years before 
I, I, I had earned money that wasn't taking us into our savings. And with where you're at now, I know you've got um, a big focus on actually coaching uh, people like myself up and coming life coaches. What's your split between uh, regular clients and, um, and, and coaches who are looking to uh, you know, become better coaches? It's probably about 75% coaches now. And it, and it happened very much organically about six, seven years ago. So w when I did dive into marketing and started to do pretty well with it and raise my you know, authority and people see me online, people automatically started coming to me and saying, you know, your oh, coaches, can you help me do that? And so over the years, it, like I say, it's moved organically. But I just love working with coaches because, um, you know, as, as True coaching, coactive coaching, our job is to ask questions and right. to listen. Our job is to help a client think differently by using a question, not by saying, go and do this or that or advise people. And sometimes that can be tough for coaches when, when you can see something glaringly obvious, but you really shouldn't be telling them because it's glaringly obvious to you in your map of the world, and that's not the client's map of the world. But working with coaches, I can see them going to make mistakes, say, with online marketing on social media or, 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 you know, whatever it is, or building a funnel or whatever. And I'm like, no, trust me, that's not going to work. So it gives me that flexibility. I like going back and forth between the two. So from, you know, pure coaching into more of a mentoring, teaching thing where I can say, look, this won't work and this is why it won't work. So don't do it. So, so yes, yeah, so it's about 75%. And... I'm just leery of it being a hundred percent because I'm not sure that I want to be the coach that doesn't coach normal clients. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people that have gone into that because they couldn't make a successful business. Right. And I don't want people thinking, oh, it's just coaching coaches because they can't get any clients themselves. Yeah. So <laughs> interesting, interesting. I love it. So um, I want to touch on the um, the coactive coaching. That, mm -hmm. that you were schooled in and, and talking about that distinction between letting people discover answers for themselves and, and wanting to jump in with your point of view. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I haven't been trained in that coactive um, uh, process. So can you talk a little bit more about that? And is it kind of like your ethical duty with your training not to um, step in with something that you think is obvious or is it just like this is going to get them the best results if they stumble upon it themselves or both? Right, so, so the book, Coactive Coaching, which is really the book that the industry was built on, was, writ was written probably probably over 20 years ago now, I think on edition five. But since it's been written, there's been a lot of advances in neuroscience where, where they've actually started to show that when people come to a conclusion themselves, it's much, much more likely to stick and they, they apply it. So that was always a theory that people, if people come up to, with their own answers, they're going to want to implement them and stick with them. But it was kind of just anecdotal. Well, this seems like the right thing to do. Well, now we know that when, when people, when that happens, that there's <clears throat> a, a change in the brain that really allows lasting change to, to happen and, and occur. So, but, you know, you can every now and then say to a client, can I offer a piece of advice? This is just a piece of advice or just an observation. I'm not saying you should do this. I'm saying you might want to consider it. You can do that from time to time. You know, there are coaching purists out there that are just like, you know, up in arms. Oh my God, you can't ever do something like that. At the end of the day, it's, it's the results of the client game that's important, not how we got them there. Right. You know, as long as we don't think the getting dragging them there is the, the right way to do it because they'll just go back to previous behaviors. All right. Well, it's a nice segue speaking about getting results for clients. Um, you're obviously um, pretty passionate that that values will, will provide the most number of, of breakthroughs and the best mm -hmm. bang for your buck. And that's what your latest book is about. So let's, let's dive into values. Why are they important Tim? Well, because they really underpin everything. I mean, they, they so a lot of coaches will do, and, and I've never really done this. I've never really got into the whole goal setting thing because, you know, my, my take on that is uh, you can go and join my, uh, subscribe to my newsletter and you'll get a book on how to set goals. That's it. You don't need me to help you set goals. It's a pretty easy process. But it's setting the right goals. It's a difficult bit. 
So goals that are underpinned by values rather than, so we all know serial goal setters, they'll set a goal and they'll hit it. It's like, oh, well, that didn't quite hit the spot. Obviously it wasn't a big enough one, I'll set another one and then another one. And it never does because you're not in alignment with the values. So let's suppose in, let's suppose in you're an athlete and you, and you want to perform in the Olympics in eight years time and you do all the work and, you, and then two weeks beforehand, you, you're number one in, in, in your, in your speciality than two weeks beforehand, you blow out your Achilles. So if you hated the training, if that was a goal just after the, you know, the significance or whatever you want to call it, getting the goal, if that was the only reason you were doing that, you've just wasted eight years of your life. But if, it, if, if, you're, if you've got values of commitment, if you've got values of determination, of integrity, all these kind of things that you can incorporate into what it is you're doing, then, yeah, it's still a devastating blow, but it's not quite the same. So somebody come, I had a guy come to me one time. He, he had a, his goal was to earn $3 billion. And the last time I spoke to him, he was close to a billion because he sold his business to the Singaporean government. So there are people out there hitting these things. And now that goal in and of itself, $3 billion, doesn't tell you anything about the client. He could have wanted it because he wanted to go all Wolf of Wall Street and get 20 hookers onto a boat and a load of cocaine and sail around the Caribbean for two years. Right. Or he could have wanted to build medical centers for the impoverished. You know, so it's getting deep down, you know, the why. I mean, I, I don't like the use of the why word in coaching. In fact, I, I, it's almost never helpful in coaching because it puts people on the defense and asking them to justify themselves. But I do like it with values. This is where it can be useful. And um, Simon Cernick, is it, pronounced his book? He did a, a TED talk on it and then wrote a book on, on why. And that's fine because he was talking about values. He was saying, you know, Apple drilling down. Why? Why is this? And that's what you do with values. You keep going. Why is that important? And, you know, what does that give you? And these kind of questions that you, you start to get to, you should get to a level where these are the things that you're just not prepared to compromise. You know, so if you've got a, um, so like I said, I worked in sales and integrity was important to me. And that's one of the reasons why I was always uncomfortable in, in sales because there are salespeople that operate with integrity as much as they can. And I, I like to think that I was one of them, but there aren't many sales organizations that operate with integrity. And I, I never worked for one above about 20 people. It was just about, you know, so if that's the case, so if you value integrity, then you need to find a job that allows you to operate with integrity. Otherwise, yeah, are. I know. Um, uh, in in my past lives, I've I've taken jobs that didn't necessarily fire me up, or or I knew wow. kind of in my in my gut weren't right, and we'll and we'll, we'll we'll get to that gut feeling. Um, and then I found myself in a place where I was um, numbing myself with whatever alcohol and whatever else to just kind of. Mm -hmm keep ignoring, I guess, what those, those core values are. Um, how does one kind of figure out what their core values are? I mean, I know this is integral to your, your method that you're talking about, and, and why is that uh, important that they do that? I mean, there is a, <clears throat> yeah, to explain the actual method would probably take a, a couple of hours on some videos, but there is a, a dirt, down and dirty method you can do, it will give you a rough idea, and that's just to ask yourself a question, what's important to me? Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when the answer comes up, say the answer is money. So money can never be evaluated because it, it's what money can potentially give somebody that's the actual core value. Money is just a you know, means, means for them. So if you say, you know, what's important, money? Well, what does money give you? Well, it gives me a nice house. What does a nice house give you? Well, it gives me status. Okay, so now we're starting to get to something that's probably a value of status. What does status give you? Um, it gives me a sense of freedom. A bit of a jump there but so, okay so that's maybe the, and you keep drilling down now you may come to two and you'll start to go you know freedom gives, gives, money gives me security security gives me freedom freedom gives me security whatever so um and and that will do it but it, it it's it's not bang on accurate but it's certainly better than not doing it at all so anybody listening to this go and do that go and figure out because here's what you'll find You'll find some values, and then you'll re if you start to think about start to think about the easiest way to dem demonstrate it. Think about somebody maybe you don't really like. You, they're okay, but there's something about them. You're almost certainly going to find a conflict. 
the value of confidence in there. So maybe like integrity is important to you and you went out for a meal and you stiff the waiter or something like that. It could be something that you barely even noticed at the time, but now there's just this sense, you know what, I don't really like this person anymore. But you think about that in jobs, so it, it, and then it goes up a, a whole different notch. Right. I want to talk about the, the value conflicts with those people in our lives. Um, I know you mm -hmm. um, uh, mentioned in, in one of your videos, we were, we were talking about, you know, people with different uh, views on our, on our current president. And when, mm -hmm. you, when people like butt heads on that, um, what's the best way to kind of deal with those value conflicts with those people in our lives? Well, I, th I think if there are people close to you, I mean, it, you know, it depends how, it depends how strongly you feel about something. So, so my dad was a, was a Tory, a Thatcher, Mark Thatcher supporter. I wasn't. We lived at home together. I was at op to the opposite end of the political spectrum. We just didn't talk about it then. <laughs> there was just no point. You know, there was, I, I'm not saying we never talked about it, but for the most part, I wouldn't bring it up. That you know, he was seventy or whatever. You know, died in the war, conservative. So I think for the most part, I think there's some values that you know it's difficult to ignore them or not talk about them. So if you've got you know if you've got any, if you've got a, a core value of um, an anti value of infidelity, and your partner's cheating on you, not a fact what you can do about that other than maybe you know seek therapy or sit to get a divorce you know, so, so some things are just you know, I said before that it's almost like the things that you're prepared to die for these are the things that you go get there's no compromise with these so I think you have to look at it on a you know a, a case by case basis I mean if if it's something minor like you know I stress my wife by not um not emptying the dishwasher but we can kind of get around that you know so, yeah, you know, I think it really just depends on how, how damaging it is to the relationship, how avoidable it is. You can sit down and say, I'll tell you what, we, we don't talk about this. Right. All right. Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, those values that, that you die for, um, I'm in a transformational leadership course right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about is like, how do you change the world, right? <clears throat> And obviously, you know, a commitment to love and connection is an important part of that. Mm -hmm. How do we, um, we obviously can't change these core values with some folks because they're so ingrained in them. But right. as we think about ways to change the world, how do we, how do we deal with those values? Is it like you just said, we, we, we kind of ignore them and find common ground? <coughs> yeah, I, I think so. But I mean, that's, so I, I know exactly what it because I want to be, I want to be that person that always is kind to other people and I will go out of my way to help people. But then every now and then I'll find, you know, Trump will say something and I'll be like, oh, I can't, I, I just can't deal with, it. I can't give a kind answer to that response or whatever. So you're probably asking the wrong man is what I'm saying, because I believe in the concept, you know, the, 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 the Buddhist approach, you know, of treating everybody with, with kindness because we're all going through our own private hell to a certain extent you know taking trump as an example the man is clearly unhappy he's deeply unhappy and you can i when i do a, a loving kindness metabavana meditation where may I be well may you be well may well my the person that, that uh, i'm at odds with i always use trump to send him you know <laughs> i might even sound very convincing but i do so, <laughs> so, I, so i think that is the only way but, but then what happens is people think, well, I'm not doing it first. Yeah, they, they've got to do it first. They've wronged me, therefore they, you know, they need to get the shit together. So I don't know, but good, if you pull it off, good luck if it's a project. Awesome, awesome. Um, what are some of the um, stories or ahas that some of your clients have had going through this value work that kind of pop up in your mind where you think like, Wow, I'm so glad I do this value work. Otherwise, we might not have um, hit this. Yeah, I mean, the, the, probably the best example I'll, I've, I've still ever had, and it was probably over ten years ago now. I think I, I changed the details of the person around in the book, uh, but anyway, um, there was a guy that came to me who worked in. Um, he, he was an IT guy, 
but he was only working three days a week and he was he was um he was doing law school with the with the other time plus he got a, a small child and <clears throat> his wife didn't work so it was how good was his IT? It was earning enough money from those three days to pay for himself to go through law school. Anyway, so he came to see me, he wanted to know that he was doing the right thing. He'd gone through his first year, and it was criminal law. He'd gone through his first year and he was stopping the class and he just wanted to make sure. So we did the values process and it was a face-to-face -face client and I've got a whiteboard on my board. So I started writing them down and I can't remember what his core values were, but I always look at people's anti-values. What, what are those things that are just not acceptable to you ever? And his top two were stress and conflict. I think it was stress and conflict. So I wrote them down and um, I'm pointing, and he's sort of nodding his head and going, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I'm like trying to point him at the antibodies. I said, what about these? I said, you know, you're going into criminal law and you're trying to avoid stress and conflict. And um, I would love to say, Ben, that he saw the light, but he actually said, I can still remember what he said to me. He said, well, you can teach me stress management uh, techniques. I'm like, yeah, I can, but the best stress management technique is to not get stressed in the first place or put yourself in to a stressful situation. Right. So I'm giving an example where it actually didn't work just because it was so extreme, you know, and that goes into all these cognitive biases and down with the fact that he spent all that time putting um, time and, and, and money. Um, but that's the kind of thing. I did have a guy actually who was a lawyer who I, I did the process with and his top two values were family and I think it may have been freedom. I'm, I can't remember for sure now. And he was just um, considering taking, he was a, uh, an associate to a partner. So he's an associate in law and they'd offered him a, a partnership position but he knew it was going to mean more traveling and considerably more time away. And I just put, again, it was a face to face fight. I put him on the whiteboard and he just started laughing. He says, we've done it here, aren't we? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's obvious, you know, family and freedom or, or whatever it was coming before money. Right. And that's the thing. Money clouds everything, Ben. Money clouds everybody's... Last job I took in sales, I, wore, I was being shown my place, huge multinational um, HR outsourcing company in Europe. A fantastic, amazing place, all with chrome and glass, you know, these places and like. And I decided walking out thinking, I, I, I just don't want this. I just do not want to work at a place like this. I don't. Anyway, he said, can you go and see the managing director, which would be the CEO here? Yeah. I walked into the office, he said, uh, well, Tim, I'd like to offer you £15,000, which is not $20,000, golden hello. Poof, what was that? I didn't want the job. Of course I wanted the job. Took him, took him up on the offer, literally, literally bought a BMW on the way home. Stopped him, but before my wife said, I've got a job and I've got a BMW. Three months later, I was miserable to send. You know, you forget about the car. That, that'll inspire you for a few days. You forget about the extra money. You've still got to, you know, for me, the integrity that was always a problem. Um, so, you know, you risk, you risk, um, ignoring your values at your, at your peril, and and the real the, re, the real cool thing with him is the message that nobody's going to get. Ben is that if you live in alignment with your values, money's so less important than you think it is, as long as you're taken out of abject poverty. You know, right. Everybody gets that money doesn't bring happiness, but everybody gets it for everybody else. Oh, I know it doesn't bring him happiness, but guess what? If I got those YouTube shoes or whatever, or that Caribbean cruise, I actually would be happy. But it's, it's it, you know, which is why people get confused when there's bit poorer people that are happy and rich, but it's all to do with values because they're more in alignment with the values and living and how they're meant to live, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with that. So like once, once our basic needs are met, um, money only gives us those quick hits of dopamine rather than any no, lasting. Exactly. exactly. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through with your book and I highly recommend it to, to people as, as well as the, the videos that, that come with it. Um, what, when, when coaches start implementing um, this value practice, what are, what are some of the ahas they have and what are some of the fumbles that they make when, when starting to implement this with clients? Well, the, the ahas are pretty much what we've talked about is, is getting the clients, suddenly thinking, 
oh my God, I thought this about that client and then this tells me something completely different. So remember, the, 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 excuse me, there's two sides to it. So the one side is the client getting the ahas, but the second side is the, us as coaches being able to coach people from their map of the world. You know, so to step it. I mean, we can never do it entirely. We're always looking at the world through our own beliefs and values or whatever, but to have a clearer, uh, a clearer idea of that is, is super important. So uh, what was the second part? Sorry. So the second part is um, what are some of the fumbles that people make along the way when oh, starting the process? Yeah, yeah, the biggest one is thinking it's more complicated than it is. So there's a matrix that you can use that you fill in and it's like a spreadsheet thing. It looks super complicated and people just freak out and see that and don't want to go any further. You can learn it in about 15 minutes if you've got IQ above room temperature. It just looks a little bit confusing. So, um, and I think also one of the things that I've, I've, I've really gone to pains to in this book that I didn't do in the original version is to explain the importance of priming so the c coaches can tend to have a oh yeah you know, what what is looking at their values going oh that's a nice value well that's a good value that's the same value as mine and suddenly you're priming your client to give you even though they don't know it and you don't know it to give you answers that uh, are maybe not accurate so i think that was something when i've watched coaches doing it i, I was aware of um but other than that it's just it's like anything better it's, do it two or three times and get into the flow and it's, and it's just at the end of the day it's just a coaching tool i mean i think it's a great tool but you know uh, i would <laughs> <laughs> awesome and and in the process of, of 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 writing the book and now re-releasing this book what um what wisdom can you share with um with other aspiring authors i hopefully hopefully it's not like the the coach thing where you say if i knew what i knew now i wouldn't do it but right right <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting you should say that because this, so I've written 10 books, but this is, um, one was has been released all over, all over the world that I co-authored. Um, but this is the first one. So, so I've done, I've done a launch where I just sold it off my website. We've done, a, a, I've had two books that were actually published, so the publisher did the launch one, and the rest were all like, you know, $5 e-books off my website. But this one. It's the first one I've done where I'm just going after Amazon. So what, I, what I've learned from this is you need more time than you think. You know, getting blurbs is way harder than you think. Even from people you know damn well, you've gone out of your way to help them. People have all sorts of problems with emails when you're asking for a favour for a book. <laughs> but, but, here's, it's a, but here's the thing, so Ben, I hate being asked being asked to read a book. I hate somebody saying, yeah, I can't say my book, will you, will you read it? First of all, I, I just get sent so many because clients will send them me and you know people that want me to review on the website and so on and so forth. But you, you've got to think about it like this. So the, the Clarity Method is a short book. You can read it in about two and a half hours, three hours tops. But most books are probably more like five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine ten hours. So you're really asking somebody to give you like six or seven hours of their time. So I would say, bear that in mind. I didn't to begin with, and bear that in mind. Um, and, and yeah, give yourself plenty of time. It's, it's tough. All right. Is there anything else that we, uh, that we haven't covered today um, about you, your practice, your book, that uh, that would be good for, for listeners to, to know? Um, thanks for putting on the spot with that one. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think we've pretty much, um, pretty much done it. Uh, books out on, on May 22nd, hopefully. So uh, if I can get all the blurbs done, the cover done. And um, yeah, I, I just want, you know, I'm really keen. Obviously, there's a, you know, I want to make sacks of cash. It's really just about the money, Ben, obviously. But I would like to help some, uh, and I'm at, I would like to uh, just help other coaches be more successful at what they do. But also maybe I'd like to see it be used by people in the workplace, managers in the workplace, so that they can get, you know, I think it's super important. You look at the big, look at Zappos, for example, and how they treat their employees and how the, the onboarding process and what. And it's kind of like, why aren't more companies looking at, at, at businesses like Zappos that take value super seriously and say, look, they seem to be doing okay, let's do the same. So yeah, so I'm looking to see more managers. And that goes back to how can we make 
the, the, the world a better place. That will be a start, won't it? People, yeah. man, managers respecting the people that work under them and, and genuinely wanting the best for them as well as themselves. All right, last question. I don't know if this is going to be more on the spot or less on the spot, but <laughs> when, you, um, when people come to you and they're like, I'm not sure what my purpose is and they're in that quandary, um, how do you work with them on that question, assuming values is a great place to start? Well, yeah, it, it, it is. I, I mean, nobody would ever come to me uh, with something that totally and utterly vague. There will be some follow-up questions, you know, uh, you know, what do you enjoy doing? You know, do you want to work with other people or do you prefer to work on your own? You know, so the bit, but, but the values would, would be the, the, the basis for that. So I'd say, okay, let's do the values process. And if we get peace at number one, okay, well, what does that tell us? Is that peace of mind or is that world peace? Yeah, in which case, go and join the peace club. No, you know, whatever. So it, it would really depend uh, what comes out of that. And that's that's one of the reasons why I'm not super keen on on life coaching packages. People, when I say packages, are programs. So you say, you know, coach takes on a client, you do this in the first session, this in the second session, this in the third. Because first of all, I, I just see it as lazy coaching. But, but also, so my first session is always like an intake, looking at everything, trying to get see where everything fits together. And the second session is almost always core values. But I don't know what I'm going to do in session three, because I don't know what's going to happen in the first two. You know, so everybody's different. You know, I've, I've never had, in doing this process 14 years, Ben, I've never had um, a client have the top, uh, same top three values as I have. Because there's millions of permutations and there's millions of ways of looking at the world. All right. That, did that answer it? It did, it did. Yeah, it and then uh, one last, one last selfish question. Um, if you could shake new coaches in the shoulders and be like, oh my God, will you stop doing this? Uh, what would that be? Uh, coaching friends and family. Okay. You cannot coach friends and family. I'll tell you for why. Okay. First of all, if you suck, they're probably not going to tell you. And if they tell you, you're probably going to get into an argument. <laughs> Second of all, they're probably going to tell you you're really good, but you've no way of knowing if you were really good. Third and most importantly, the whole point of coaching is that we go in with a blank sheet, that we have no preconceptions or ideals of what we think is right. So if, you, if, if a coach coaches a family member or a friend or whatever, you know, we're talking about prime, priming before, they're automatically, they probably already think they know what's right for this person. Uh, even if they say, no, no I, you know, I can, I, I can disregard that. You, you can't. You can't disregard it. It's like when somebody, you know, an, an attorney said in the court of law, but he did it. Strike that from the record. But he could strike it from the record, but everybody heard it, you know. So, so yeah, that, that's a, probably one of the biggest bugbears of the May. It's just it's a total no-no. Awesome. Awesome. Well, cool. Um, I really appreciate your time and, and sharing your, your method course, and your you. wisdom with us. Um, where can people find more about you? Uh, my main site now is coachthelifecoach.com. Um, and then they bought the Clarity Method. There is a site for the Clarity Method as well, but it was just a holding page, really. So really, coachthelifecoach.com. Awesome. Well, I'll have links to that in the show notes. Um, so Tim, thanks so much. I um, really appreciate your wisdom and, and look forward to finishing the book and, and um, mapping out my, my own values as well as uh, those of my clients as well. Cool. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Purpose Up with me, Ben Stein. Please subscribe here on YouTube so you can be updated on when the latest episodes come out as well on Apple, Spotify, or wherever else you consume podcasts. And since you're still sticking around, I've got a special free gift for you. Just go to purposeup.com slash free gift or click this link here to get book recommendations from me, a guided meditation, as well as a book I wrote on how to live your life more purposefully. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I really appreciate it and you.